So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Geoffrey uh, Katerega. I'm from uh, the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team and MAP Uganda. Um, and I'm very uh, happy to be able to speak to you uh, this afternoon about our work that we are doing uh, with uh, refugees and the community uh, in Uganda. Um, so uh, Uganda is uh, renowned for uh, its uh, incredibly uh, progressive policy towards refugees. Um, people say it is one of the best in the world. And I would just like to uh, try to illustrate this. Uh, how, does, uh, uh, how is the refugee policy uh, for refugees in Uganda? So uh, in the past year, the refugee population uh, in Uganda rose from about uh, 500 to over 1.3 uh, million refugees. So most of these refugees are coming in from uh, South Sudan uh, because of the insurgents there. Uh, then uh, the DRC, uh, Burundi, um, Somalia, and others from Eritrea, uh, Rwanda. And you can imagine all of these people coming in. Uh, you can see uh, the circles which show the locations of the uh, refugee settlements. Uh, most of them, uh, the biggest refugee settlements are in the northern part of the country. So there we have Bidi Bidi, which is the biggest refugee settlement in the world in terms of size. Um, most of these refugees uh, that are coming in, actually most of them, the biggest percentage is uh, women and children. And uh, these are like, uh, the most uh, vulnerable. Um, so the refugee uh, uh, thing, how it works in Uganda is that when the refugees come in, uh, they're integrated within the community. Uh, they can get work, they can uh, work in Uganda freely, they have freedom of movement, so someone is not reflected, uh, restricted to the refugee uh, settlement. They can move out and go to, uh, anywhere uh, in the country. Um, they have access to uh, social services, uh, such as health and education. But then you also have to realize that uh, they are sharing the same kind of resources uh, with the local people. So it doesn't mean that Uganda already had these uh, resources in excess. They were already a few, but now they have to share them with this big number of people that are coming in. Um, when you look at uh, Uganda's population, uh, we are the world's youngest uh, our population, over 78% of the population is below the age of 30. Uh, the median age right now in Uganda is 15.9. Uh, so we are a younger uh, population, but that also comes uh, with uh, its own uh, challenges as well as uh, opportunities. So uh, we have been doing mapping uh, in northern Uganda uh, and western Uganda, most of the places where the refugee settlements are. I'll just give a quick example of Arua uh, district, which is uh, one of the uh, districts uh, hosting uh, refugees in Uganda. So because uh, when the refugees come, they're integrated into the community, um, we don't just map only refugee settlements. We also have to do mapping in the uh, hosting uh, sub-counties in places where they're not refugees because they're sharing uh, the same resources. So what is happening is we have uh, many organizations, NGOs, which are responding to the uh, refugee situation. Uh, the leading, of course, is UNHCR, and it has uh, 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 other partners that are implementing uh, their projects. So, they come in with uh, their programs to try to uh, respond to the situation. And uh, most of the focus, most time, is put in on the refugee settlements. But even the people outside the refugee settlements, or the uh, local community, also need uh, these services. Uh, for example, if, if someone is providing water or uh, wants to build a school, 
where should they build it? Um, so our mapping that we are doing, uh, working with the uh, community, working with uh, NGOs, is trying also to fill the data uh, gap so that uh, this information can be used to uh, plan when they are, uh, are, are, are putting resources where they're supposed to go. So we do trainings. Uh, the picture that you see, that's a group of community members and refugees. So they were just trying out uh, uh, open map kit, uh, which is an, an open data kit, which is the tool we use for food mapping for the first time. So you can see they're raising their hands trying to find the GPS signal, uh, because then they want to uh, actually point out where the facility is. Um, so usually the process uh, revolves around uh, first remote mapping. So we start off with remote mapping, and then we go on ground and now add more detailed information. So very many times we put up tasks uh, on the task, hot tasking manager, um, requesting people to come in and help and map. And uh, uh, I'd like to say thank you to uh, the people from the uh, Global SM community who normally uh, participate uh, and uh, help map in Uganda. Um, most of the time, uh, they organize uh, mapathons. So uh, this was uh, from the Missing Maps Mapathon in London. And they were mapping uh, our uh, tasks. Um, normally, they ask us to give a, a small presentation before the mapping starts. So you can see everyone was looking at the uh, screen, trying to hear about our work. But uh, other people also contribute uh, from where they are. So thank you very much to everyone who uh, helps to map uh, Uganda. Um, so when we go to the part of, of, of now uh, adding things that are important uh, on the map uh, with our uh, surveyors, we, uh, we came up with a, a data model uh, and we're mapping things like health facilities, uh, water points, uh, sanitation points, education facilities, um, cast-based interventions, and other facilities. So uh, the CBIs are things like, you know, when the refugees go into the settlements, they also try to start up small, small businesses to try to survive. And so we also try to map those. Um, so we picked out uh, just these things because uh, the place that we're mapping was so big and also we had to had like time limit to do it. So. That's, that was our focus. And the other thing about this data model is uh, that we are also partnering with organizations. Yes, uh, we, we are working with them and we are helping to provide them with data that they need for their planning and uh, m and &E, but they also have uh, some things that they are most interested in. And some of the things are not uh, things that have, can go on open street map. So when we uh, develop the data model, we sometimes we include those things that are not going to open street map uh, in the questionnaire. But then when we reach the time of data cleaning, we try to separate the two. So the data that's going into open street map and the data that uh, is going to the partners. Um, one of the uh, challenges we faced was uh, mapping uh, refugee uh, boundaries. So when you look at the uh, open map tagging system for boundaries, it's already well, well structured for administrative boundaries. So country, district, uh, sub-counties, divisions. But when you come to uh, refugee uh, settlements, uh, it's not the case. Uh, in Uganda, we call them settlements, uh, not camps, because of the refugee policy that people are settled, they are given land to till and, and things like that. So you find a very big settlement, uh, which is uh, subdivided into zones, which are subdivided into blocks, uh, which are subdivided into tanks. So it's very strange that uh, you find people using tanks for addresses in refugee settlements because what happens is when UNSR comes and uh, puts water points, for people that's the, their address, like I live in tank 14, 
So you find a, a big refugee camp with around uh, 100 tanks. But each group of people, small group of people, go, collects water from a certain water tank. And that water tank becomes their address. So it tells you, for me, I come from tank 14. So how do you put this on OpenStreetMap? It has a boundary, yes, but what administrative, I mean, what tag are you going to use? So we uh, propose uh, a refugee camp boundary uh, tagging proposal, and we are getting uh, uh, good feedback uh, from the OSM community on how we can uh, do it well. Uh, also looking at already what was suggested before. Uh, we do a collaborative mapping. Uh, the lady you see there in the picture is called uh, 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 Viola, but she is a refugee. She's a refugee from South Sudan. She worked with us to uh, map her settlement, uh, where she lives now, because she doesn't know that she's going back to her own country. Um, the place which was uh, new to her, uh, apart from just the settlement, she was able to also use like satellite imagery to see what is around her. So uh, it's capacity building, but also it's collaborative because in the same room we have uh, refugees, a, lo a refugee alongside a community member, and they are sharing you know, the same resources and they're trying to put them on the map. They're adding roads. Uh, so we also don't uh, stop from asking them to carry a phone and pick points. We also give them training on how to map. And we think uh, this also help when they go back to their country at one point, they can maybe start another OSM community there. Uh, and also we try to bring them on the same table with uh, even the NGO. So when we do training, we bring everyone in the same place and talk about sharing data. Uh, because some of these organizations uh, that um, uh, respond to the refugees do uh, data collection of their own. Uh, so you find everyone collecting data, but they're not sharing. So one of the things we're trying to do is share them open switch map as a way of sharing data. Because if everyone is collecting data on water points, why not uh, one person collecting the data and then share? Uh, so when, the, when we go down to the uh, communities, um, we try by uh, starting with a basic map. So we print the map as it is, blank, and then ask people, what information would you like to add to this map? Can you locate your village? Uh, so we try also to you know, uh, get people to appreciate what a map is and that they can make this change and make an improved map of their area. So here people we are getting papers and pointing out places where they stay before actually going down uh, and adding uh, information uh, on the map. And then the other thing that we use are border borders. Uh, so border borders in Uganda are motorcycles, uh, public transport called border border. So these border borders, what they help us to do is to do also a community uh, knowledge, uh, because they already know where these places are. And some of the people we are working with are refugees who are new in the area. Sometimes they don't know even the local language. So we engage uh, motorcycle uh, cyclists who uh, do public transport. So we pair them up. So a surveyor goes with a, ref uh, a motorcycle person, and they drive around stop at a school, map it, stop at a water point, map it, uh, stop at a health facility, map it. Um, so they, the border border cyclists give us uh, local knowledge because they already know uh, the network of the place. And also they help to do the community entry for the refugee where he would otherwise uh, find uh, challenges. So here, they're just starting off their day and they're just trying to strategize, okay, I'm going to this parish us how many villages, how do we, so they make the plan together, and then they head out and do the uh, field mapping. Um, some of them have to uh, face a few challenges in the field. Uh, for example, uh, Maui here had to cross a river. Uh, so the place where the refugees are is uh, just on the west of River Nile, and 
sometimes reach the other village, someone has to cross a river. So I have to cross with the motorbike. Uh, so if this is a refugee who doesn't know the place and has to cross a river to go the other side to, uh, to do mapping, it will be very hard without this motorcycle cyclist. Uh, yeah, the other hacking that we have to do is uh, also to uh, try to find a way for people to charge phones because, you know, uh, the GPS drains a lot of battery. Uh, if you are going to move around the whole day uh, collecting data, then the battery is going to run down in you know, three hours, and you have to map for maybe six hours. So what we try to do is to connect uh, the, foot, the charger to the battery of the motorcycle. So as someone is moving around, uh, he's charging. So. Uh, those are some of the things we have to do to overcome some of the challenges we face in the field. Uh, this is, uh, these are the GPX tracks from our surveyors as they moved around the whole district. And you can see from uh, the colors, the speed where they were moving fast and where they're moving slowly. So um, we, do, we use this data to uh, improve the road network. Uh, we created a task and asked people to uh, help use this to convert data into, uh, into roads. So it helps us also to, for our monitoring of, of the work as they are doing the work to know which places were possibly missed out. If there are no trucks here, what does it mean? Does it mean there are no facilities there? Does it mean no one went there? So uh, we collect GPX tracks as well as uh, using uh, the ODK and OMK to collect uh, the information. Um, this is just a picture to show you some of the facilities uh, that are found there. So this, these are two water points. Uh, this is the water point in the refugee settlement. Uh, another one is a water point in the community. Um, but uh, the question is, uh, who of the two is better? The other lady doesn't have safe water, but this one also has to line up for the whole day to be able to access water. So the facilities are not enough. If an organization is uh, responding to this, they want to know where each of these points are and what the attributes are, uh, how many people are accessing this in a day. So that's of the, some of the information we try to uh, collect. Um, this is uh, a kiosk, a small kiosk, a business set up by refugees in the settlement to try to uh, survive. So we also map uh, these kind of uh, things. Uh, and then when it comes to giving feedback to the uh, NGOs and, and government, we uh, make interactive maps um, to answer simple questions like, in the whole settlement. So this is Rhino Camp sub uh, refugee settlement. So you give information like which water points are working and which ones are not working so that, uh, because the organization have resources to respond to this, we give them the information and then they respond and uh, solve the problem. Uh, we also uh, make printed maps. Uh, for example, this one, we did it for our World Food Program. So they have points where they uh, distribute food. But it's also important to uh, put the distribution points in places where, uh, where they're mostly needed. So we get like population data using the building footprint and also show the location of the food distribution points. Um, so like I said, we are using ODK uh, to collect data. And we use WhatsApp a lot. Uh, so to get uh, feedback from the uh, surveyors as they're out there uh, collecting their uh, data. Although now we have to change to something maybe like Telegram because uh, the government has just put tax on WhatsApp. So use WhatsApp and your text. So I have to find a solution. Um, after collecting this data, uh, it is, we put it on the ODK uh, server, and then that's why we pick it from, clean it up before going to OpenStreetMap. So we have 
uh, a data cleaning uh, pipeline. Like I said, we collect also data that is for uh, NGOs that's not going to OSM. So part of our data cleaning process is also to separate the two uh, so that we have data that's ending up in OpenStreetMap and has been cleaned, or the tagging has been verified that is fine uh, before it ends up into OpenStreetMap. Um, we also do a uh, 2A quality assurance uh, to make sure that uh, the data that we are collecting is, is good. So we have internal validation by our team, uh, but also for uh, things like remote mapping, uh, we base on um, crowdsourced information to, you know, uh, to get help from the uh, global SM community. So very many people on validation Friday that's run by the missing maps, they come in and help uh, validate the information. Um, Interagency coordination, in the picture on the left, that's a community member, uh, a refugee, and an NGO officer on the same table uh, doing uh, open suite maps. So we do a lot of trainings and, uh, so, and JAI support for all of these kind of organizations. Uh, this is our government. Uh, we're also uh, training government. This is the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. So we were doing a community uh, an OSM training with them, and actually they would like to use OpenStreetMap uh, for the upcoming census, the next census. So that's a discussion we are having with them. So it's also helping us, the project is also helping us to promote OpenStreetMap to government and uh, other organizations. Um, we have printed uh, maps, so just imagine a sub-count officer who uh, serves a lot of people but doesn't have any map in their office. So for the first time, we are giving them maps that they are putting in their offices, and these maps have been, the data that's on the map has been collected by their own uh, people in their own community. So we are reaching out to those as well. The another thing we are doing is also uh, creating the map as of tomorrow. So uh, we are going beyond the uh, universities. They're also reaching out to secondary schools and showing them open street map and their picking interests, okay? Of course, there are challenges where you go to school and they don't have uh, devices to carry this on. Uh, but we like it to have uh, got, uh, uh, participated in the NetHop grant devices uh, that was through HOT, uh, where we can use these devices to uh, help run such uh, trainings. Um, the other thing that is so good uh, is that uh, the HOT presence uh, in Uganda is also helping uh, to grow uh, the OSM community, the local OSM community. So in the two years that HOT has worked in Uganda, it has helped to strengthen and grow the local OSM community. Uh, Right now we have uh, Map Uganda, which is an NGO, a local NGO, non-for-profit, which has been now registered and can now also uh, grow its own activities around OpenStreetMap. We're also happy to say we are the country with the biggest number of youth mappers chapters in the world, eight, and uh, yeah. A few other countries are trying to challenge us, but we are not going to allow them. We shall remain on top. We are opening up new ones very fast. Um, but also, we, um, we, are, we are trying to grow the network of OpenStreetMap around the whole of Africa. So we are getting in touch with different OSM communities from all over Africa, and we are trying to work together uh, to share resources, to learn from each other, success, challenges, and, and grow the community. Uh, one of the things we want to do is also to uh, make sure uh, that um, they all become local uh, chapters. We organized set of the map Africa last year. It's coming back in 2019. You're all welcome to Africa. Uh, so with that, we are trying to create coordinator collaboration and also showcase the possibilities of OpenStreetMap. Uh, we had uh, soccer at OpenStreetMap, a uh, state of the map Africa, and from the 
The team on the right is Uganda. The team on the left is the rest of the world. Uh, do you want to know the result of the game? <laughs> so the result was 2-0 uh, in favor of the whole world against Uganda. But it was good because for, for community building, so it's, it was uh, a social event. Um, this is our team. Uh, it's a small uh, uh, team in Uganda, but the people who are doing this uh, wonderful work. So I just want to say thank you to them. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. If someone has some question for you. Uh, I had a question around uh, with the refugees. So you're mapping the, the communities in Uganda. But are you also thinking about mapping with the South Sudanese mainly? I think refugees to map the villages back into South Sudan. Because this is, for us, uh, yeah, international humanitarian organizations, it's really incredible, useful information. If they could point the name of their village on, on the map in South Sudan, and if they could point even more, like the health center, the, the school, that would be incredibly, incredibly useful information for a humanitarian organization. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Yoriki. Uh, I think that's very, very, very good suggestion. We're thinking that these refugees, when they go back, they can start OSM community. But I think we don't have to wait until they go back. We can engage them and ask them to map places where they came from. So thank you very much. That's a very good comment. You mentioned that WhatsApp has a tax from the government. How does it, how can they do it manually? How does it get implemented? How does it? How do they tax WhatsApp on an okay. application? <laughs> or was it a joke? I don't know. No, it's not a joke. Uh, it just came out uh, like a month ago. So uh, here I'm using WhatsApp and Facebook freely. When I go back to my country, I can't. You have to first pay tax. So, um, so how do they charge it? So. Um, I think they block you through your, uh, the network service provider. So they worked with the uh, telecom companies uh, to, uh, to make sure people pay the tax. So you pay the telecom company the tax before you access the service. Well, if there are no questions, thanks, Geoffrey, again. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that we are publishing uh, and uh, weekly OSM uh, in Swahili, which is a language spoken by over 80 million people. So we're going to be having new uh, issues coming out uh, in Swahili very soon. Thank you. <laughs>